God for Calvary, amen? Second Kings tonight, book of Second Kings, chapter number three. Second Kings, chapter number three. I truly do hope that you enjoy coming to church. I ask that in introductions, but I really do mean it. I hope you're excited to be in church. There's plenty of places that would be much, much worse to be at. Second Kings chapter number three. We're going to read a, a lengthy portion here, verses one down through verse 18 to get us started here this evening. Second Kings three. And I'll begin in verse number one. It says, now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, the 18th year, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 20 years. And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. And Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep master and rendered unto the king of Israel an hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with the wool. But it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And King Jehoram went out of Samaria the same time and numbered all Israel. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. And he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, the way through the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went and the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days journey. And there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. And the king of Israel said, alas, and the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, here is Elijah, the son of Shaphath, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, what have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts liveth. Before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look towards thee, nor see thee. But now bring me a minstrel, and it came to pass when the minstrel played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus, the Lord, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus said the Lord, ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water, that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. Verse 18, and this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord, which he delivered the Moabites also into your hand. Let's pray, and then we'll get into this tonight. Lord, just thank you so much for your word. Just thank you so much for the things that we can learn from it. Lord, I pray tonight that you speak through me. Lord, I pray that you hide me behind your cross, that whatever is said be only from you and directly for us. Lord, I pray tonight that um, you just use this passage of scripture to uh, relay what you've laid on my heart, Lord. Uh, I, I pray with uh, April coming that uh, this is uh, the appropriate message for this evening, for this group. Lord, and I pray that it it's home. I pray you speak to hearts. Lord, we ask that you pour your spirit out now in Jesus name. Amen. You know, uh, next month, I mentioned it somewhat this morning. We are beginning our spring program. Hey, in the spring program, I've been uh, putting it together for a few months, actually, and I'm very excited about the missions emphasis aspect of it. Because I think as Christians, as uh, children of God, it is our sole responsibility to make sure that the lost find a savior. 
right? That, that we are able to guide them to the love uh, of Christ uh, through salvation. And it's very important for us to understand in one week's time, we have the opportunity to reach lost people. That, that's what we're supposed to do. And I, I'm excited for, for uh, the opportunity as a church to be able to do that on uh, um, April 3rd, on April 10th, on Easter, on April uh, 27th, or, or whenever that next one is. And, and I, I pray, and I've been praying that we just see results. And I, I wanted to, to bring this tonight. God laid this portion of scripture on my heart because uh, grab your shovel, Hey, we, we, we got to be expecting things to come. We, as a church, we can't just say, well, we'll see souls saved, I'm sure. I, and we'll kind of get into that. But understand this, the spring program, as we go through it, missions emphasis, missions emphasis, Easter. Easter is so important every single year. But this year, we're going to have a little bit extra. We're going to have a, a, a little bit more of a focus on the gospel, on, on the salvation uh, a message, that story of Christ and Calvary and the resurrection. And I want you to bring somebody. Bring, bring somebody to church who needs to hear the gospel. We, we want to see the altar packed. We want to see souls saved every week of April. If a church isn't seeing people saved, the church isn't being a church. We're, we're supposed to do that. And the spring program is all geared towards getting people saved. May 1st, we're going to have sign-up sheets starting next week. All of April, there's going to be sign-up sheets. May 1st, we're having a spring fling. Okay, so we're going to have a, a morning service per usual, but we're not going to have an evening service that day. Instead, from noon to 5, we're going to have a big carnival right out here. Right? We're going to have games and we're going to have food and we're going to have bounce houses and we're going to have all kinds of things set up. But it's the opportunity for the church to serve our community because they need to see us loving them. That, that, that's the point of, of the spring uh, program this year. Make sure people know that they're loved by us as Christians, but more importantly, by God in whom we're supposed to be serving. That's what it's about. But, but looking at this portion of scripture, understand we have to allow God to work. Number one, we have to allow God to work in order for things like this to take place. In order for us to fully uh, um, fulfill our call as Christians, in order for us to, to see souls saved, we have to allow God to work. Look at verse number nine with me. Second Kings chapter number three, verse number nine, it says, so the king of Israel went and the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days journey. Get this. There was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. <laughs> we're, we're in trouble. We're, we're in a pickle here. These three kings, man, they are in a situation and they had a very evident need. Ah, water. We're about to wipe ourselves off the map and we done did it to ourselves. Right? We're about to mess up here. We don't have water. What are we going to do? Right? Only God could fulfill their need. And it's interesting that as we read through the, the, the kings and we understand how that they fell from God and they did evil in the sight of the Lord and they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Right, and Jehoram, uh, the son of Ahab, he, he was no different except for the fact, and Jehoshaphat, except for the fact that they didn't perform the evil like their father or, or like his mother. He, he put away the false idols, but he still followed after their sins. He, he still did evil. I mean, verse number two, he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord. He's still known for that. I look at a, a modern day uh, a Christian, uh, the, the whole Christendom atmosphere, and I, I'm kind of scared because uh, when you're reading the kings, you can see there were some very good kings, and then all of a sudden the shift began to happen. Man, we always like to, to, to bring up the past missionaries and the past pastors and, and, and these past speakers, the Billy Grahams and, and the C.S. Lewis's and, and, and the D.L. Moody's and all of these great men. And then we get to our modern day era and we say, well, 
You remember so-and-so? He really messed up. And that's what they're known for now. Hey, remember this pastor? Yeah, he was on fire, but he did. He, he done did that thing. And I, I, I worry because Christians are getting to a very complacent mindset in Christendom. We're, we're getting to a place where we want God to work, but we're not going to allow him to actually work. They knew that they needed help. In verse 10, and the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord? Isn't there someone here who still believes, who still follows, who still trusts God? Still, still that, that uh, uh, in-person individual in whom God speaks to, to speak to us? Isn't that person still around that, that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the kings of Israel's servants answered, saying, here's Elisha. Man, here's Elisha, the son of Shaphath, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. This wasn't just anybody. This was Elisha. He said, there is still somebody. I understand tonight our needs are not a, a, a blessing until we are able to give them over to God for him to fulfill. Right? They, they were looking for help from God. They, Lord, help us out here. We, we need your help. We need your blessing. We need you to intervene on our behalf. But the blessings don't come. Those things don't happen until we're able to give them fully over to God for him to fulfill in our lives. Meaning what? Allow God to do his job. I'm glad I'm not God. I'm glad he is. Because I'd be in a world of hurt. I'd be way worse off. And they understood that. Man, we're just out here to be delivered into the hand of Moab. We have to allow God to work. Matthew chapter number seven, verses seven and eight. And we can read this. It says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Man, church, I, I want us to ask God to bring people who need a savior. Bring people I mean, every month, but especially next month, we're, we're having this big push. Why? Because people are lost. There are people dying and going to hell. And what are we doing? Well, I'm sure God could do something about it. Allow God to do his work. Accept our responsibility. We got to accept our responsibility. Verse number 16 of 2 Kings 3 Verse 16, it says, and he said, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. This is what I want you to do. This is the route I want you to take. These are the steps that God wants you to perform. In Luke chapter number 14, verse number 23, we read this. It says, and the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. What does God want us to do? He wants us to be Christ-like to the point where he came to seek and save that which was lost. So we as Christians need to do the same. Missions emphasis. It's important for us to grab hold of our responsibilities in Christ Jesus. Our needs are evident. We each know somebody who needs a savior. We, we all know and we all are aware. But we cannot have a passive faith. Our, our faith, right? Our faith must move us to action. That, that's what God expects from us. Right? He, he, he wants us to realize in our lives, this is our role. This is what I want you to do. You need to get a hold of this. Meaning what? Faith by action. What does he say? He says, prove me. 
I can't prove God. I can't prove the scriptures. I can't prove the spirits. I can't prove the, the, the preachers and the teachers and, and the apostles. I can't prove them unless I take action. It's my job to make sure what I'm learning, what I'm being taught, what I'm singing, what I, all of that lines up with what I believe. I can't just sit back. Well, I'm sure God will do something. God, God can use anything to see somebody saved. But it's our responsibility. It's our place. Right? We got to go and dig. We got to pave the way. James chapter number two. We can start in verse number 14. I'll read these. It says, what doth the prophet, my brethren? Hey, Christian, what good is it? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is lukewarm Christianity in which God says he wants to just spew you out of his mouth. Faith without works is nothing to brag about. The blind man uh, that we read about in John, he comes to Christ seeking his sight and he puts the clay in the spittle and he makes it and puts it on his eyes. He says, okay, now go and wash the actions of faith. Your turn. He could have just wiped it away and seen. We, we understand that. Right? But the, the lame man, he said, okay, now take up your bed and go. The act of faith. This is my role now. My cross to carry. This is what I'm supposed to be doing now. God could give them water in 2 Kings. Lord, what are we supposed to do? Boop, here you go. Right, those magic tricks where the cup just fills up. Wow, he could have done that. He, he could have just had it to where their, their stomachs were automatically full. They're like, wait a minute, I'm not thirsty anymore. That's our God. He could have done that. Right, he could have given them water whenever he so deemed appropriate. But he says, well, without faith, without faith, the action steps of faith. Listen, without faith, it's impossible for us to please God. And that's our, that's our job. We, we should desire to please our loving Savior who gave everything. He doesn't have to keep us here. I'm a knucklehead. My mom will tell you, that's her word. I was raised a knucklehead. She said, you knucklehead. I think it's because she always hit me with her knuckle on it. Okay, it, it, it's something that we have to look at and say, man, okay, I am now supposed to take the steps of faith, right? Paul puts it faith to faith. Faith to faith. Okay, it's now, now it's time for me to take a step of faith. Man, every summer we get excited uh, in the teen department because we always have our teen summer program. That's our big push. And we have no clue who's going to show up. We have, we have no clue what teenagers are going to bring what teenagers. And at the end of our summer program, we, we've averaged about 50 to 60 teenagers for our lock-ins. But it's because we prepare for them to come. And I labor and I, and I grab Miss Allen. I say, help me make all these crazy trees. And, and she says, okay. And I, and I, I look at this and I said, why, are, why am I doing this? Because I want to see somebody saved. That's the only reason I dressed up like Alan Parrish from Jumanji this year. And people were looking at me like, who in the world is on the platform? Who's that crazy guy? 
And that's Brother Daniel. Accept our responsibility tonight. So we, we have to anticipate the blessing. We have to allow God to work. We have to accept our responsibility and we have to anticipate the blessing to come. All right, verse number 20 of 2 Kings 3, it says, And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered that behold, there came water by the way of Edom and the country was filled with water. I mean, <laughs> that would be exciting to see in and of itself. Right? When we think of digging for ditches, God didn't make it rain. God, God didn't have them just fill up from the bottom. He brought water by way of Edom. Can you imagine being the children of Israel sitting there and all of a sudden, here comes the water going into those ditches that we just dug? What is the point of a spring program? So we can prepare our hearts, our minds, our church for people to come on a day like May 1st, on a day like Easter, and they can come in and we can say, man, they just keep pouring in here. Where are they coming from? Our acts of faith and God's fulfillment. He wants to fulfill things in our lives. And it came by way of Edom and, and, and it says the country was filled with water. And it's exciting. Luke chapter number eight, verse number 43, we can see another story of faith. Familiar passage says that a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which has been all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any came behind him and touched the border of his garment and immediately her issue of blood stanched. Right? And Jesus said, who touched me? I always loved that part. Who touched me? When all denied Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee and sayest thou who touched me? Jesus said, somebody had touched me for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Children of Israel, this is what God expects you to do. Go and dig a hole. Get busy in the work. Christian, you, you want to see your church grow. You want to see souls saved. You want to see things take place. Grab your shovel. That's what he's saying. He's saying, get ready. You need to put in the work to re reap the blessing. You shall reap in due time, in due season, if you faint not. Right? That, that's when it comes, when we, we're willing to step up and we're willing to, to stand in the gap and, and to put our, our boots right to the street. Me and my pastor from our last church would often say, uh, uh, because we heard it of a man, and I'm going to get it all wrong now. He says, the, the, the shoes of a Christian ought always be dirty. Meaning what? We always should be doing something for God. Right? You know somebody who's, who's a laborer because their boots are covered in mud and dirt and oil and grime. You know a mechanic shoes because there's all kinds of stuff on them. You know somebody who's willing to do uh, uh, the mowing and the labors and all that because their shoes are covered in it. How clean are your shoes tonight? I, I can guarantee you these, these people out there digging ditches, they were covered in dust. Now, I've dug holes in Arizona. Right, we used to, me and my friends, we used to be in the BMXing, and I, I used to be in all that crazy stuff, and, and we would go out into this desert, and we would take our water and our shovels, and we would start digging in, and we'd start tearing up some ground, and then we'd make those jumps, right, those dirt jumps, so we could go, and we could jump off, and we could fall and hurt ourselves, Right, but we would go out there and man, by the time I'd come home, I know plenty of times I'd hit a jump and uh, it wasn't quite where it needed to be yet and I'd just fly and then next thing I know, I'm sliding down the other side on my face. And I'd go in the house and just covered in dirt. And my dad knew, okay, he was doing something. 
<laughs> he, he was doing something. When we used to uh, have our grooming shops, we would go in and, and renovate these uh, uh, storefront properties that we would get. And maybe it'd be a chiropractor's office or something like that. And we'd completely gut them. And then we'd go in and we'd, we'd get our metal studs and, and we'd put on our drywall and make our little stations for our groomers. And man, you'd come out of there at the end of the day covered in drywall dust. I hate drywall dust. It just sits on your sinuses and just gross and it gets everywhere and you're like, ah. At least that's what I did. But listen, as a Christian, these people understood, okay, based on what the man of God is saying, listen, tonight, based on what God has revealed to us, through his word, we can understand we have to have a faith that is alongside work. Too, too many people come in and they say they have faith, but they don't want to do anything. Listen, service and work, I think, are different things. Right? I, I can come in and I can, I can find an easy service project to give to God. Piece of cake. But when you're willing to put in some work for God and you end up sweating and bleeding. I was preaching at the, the church. Um, I got into town and I called my friend um, Josh, who's the pastor of the, the previous church that we were serving at. I said, man, I'm enjoying this weather. He said, weather? I said, yeah, it's like 75 degrees. Beautiful. He said, in Kansas? I was like, no, I'm not in Kansas. I'm in Phoenix. He said, whoa, what? He's like, you're preaching on Sunday. I said, okay. And so I ended up preaching and I got up there and I was, I was talking about how, man, there's so many fond memories in this building. I was like, my, part of my heart is still in this building. I was like, I got a lot of blood in this building. And people were looking at me like, you're crazy. But we had to put a lot of work into that place. It was just a little uh, uh, metal building that we had on this property we were renting. And we completely tore out everything and put in bathrooms and walls and all this crazy stuff. And there's a lot of sweat and blood and tears in there. But why did we do that? Why, why did me and Miss Megan spend so much time repainting and redoing the teen center and, and that little room that we're calling our resource center? And why do we go all out for these ladies events and these, these brunches? And why do we prepare for summer programs? Because we're anticipating a blessing. We, we, we are ready. We want to receive. Listen, they were digging because they needed the water, but they trusted that it would come. What are, what are we trusting God to bring into our lives right now? Man, as a church, isn't there, isn't there a cause? Shouldn't there be a, a, a unified a, a, a gathering of people willing and wanting people to get saved? To start serving? To get involved. Say, I don't know how to get involved. Ask somebody. It may not be exactly what you want to do, though. That's the problem. Hey, I can guarantee you half of those guys, I don't want to dig a hole. I'm already thirsty. I, I'm already worn out. Man, we'd go skateboarding. Uh, there's these large cement ditches in, in Arizona that we used to go and, and we'd sneak through the fence and, and we'd start tearing those up. And there's this one section that we would always go down to, but it was probably a good half mile, mile away from where we all lived. Well, on a skateboard, that gets pretty far, especially in the summer. So we'd get down there pretty early and it's nice and cool, but by midday, man, it's hot. Right? I, I remember experiencing summers of 121, 122 temperatures. And you're out there just sweating and it's like, I'm not going to make it home. So we used to go and knock on people's door. Can I use your hose? And if there was no knock, say, I'm going to use their hose. I'm not going to make it home. What are you anticipating though? This is this woman with the issue of blood. She knew that Christ was going to be coming by. And she said, listen, I, I, I'm anticipating the results. If I could just but touch the hem of his garment. I read Luke because it's a shorter portion of that. Okay, but as she says in, the, in one of the other gospels, if I could just but touch the hem of his garment, I know. And if, if we could just get some things squared away, like what, Brother Daniel? Like missions emphasis. 
Say, I don't understand it. That's dumb. No, it's not. It gives you an excuse to invite somebody. Right? I, I invite people. Hey, what are you doing on Sunday? Why? What's going on? Church is going on. Oh, I thought you had something special. It is special. Just come. But now you can say, this is something special. We're going to see uh, some videos from missionaries. We're, we're going to hear about missionary work. We're, we're going to do some things. And all of that's leading to Easter. And I want you to come back on Easter. They say, what's going on on Easter? We're going to tell you about Christ. We're, we're going to make sure that you know that you're going to heaven when you die. Hey, I want you to come and I want you to take part of this. Because then after Easter, guess what? We're going we're gonna to have something special for you on May 1st. Another special. Yeah, another one. Why? Because, hey, we wanna, want you to know that we love you. That we care for you. Where does that start? We have to allow God to do his work. If we are constantly saying something like, oh, I don't think I could do that. That's not allowing God to do anything. If we're constantly saying, well, we tried that before and it didn't quite work. That's not allowing God to do anything. If I'm constantly stepping back and saying, I don't see how this is possible. Hey, five years ago, me and my wife came out here and I looked at this property on this corner and said, I don't see how this was possible. Hey, you, you may have lived it, but do you get how it was possible? There was somebody willing to do the work. And where does that come from? He allowed God to use him. We have to allow God to work. We have to accept our responsibility. Pastor knew what his role was. We need to know what our role is. It's our responsibility to make sure that, that we go, that we work, we get our shoes a little dirty. That's, that's where it starts. And why do we do those things? Because we're anticipating the reward, the blessing to follow, that reaping of the harvest. But what takes place? The harvest is plenteous. The harvest is plenteous. We, we can see that all throughout scripture, right? This, this, this uh, obviously is in one place specifically, but all throughout we can see this imagery of there are people who need to hear about Christ. But what happens? The laborers are few. Because why? Going to church needs to be good enough for my God. I'm going to watch for lightning. Maybe this place will burn up with you walking in it. My, 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 my going to church should be good enough. You know, it's interesting. I was talking to uh, my pastor friend in Phoenix and we always get together and talk ministry. What's going on in your church? And here's what's going on in ours. And, and we compare notes and we criticize each other. And it's just a lot of fun. I say, you know, what? It, it's amazing because it happened when we were in Phoenix. I'm not saying it's unique to us, but look at Sunday morning. Let's say we average 200 people Sunday morning. Sunday nights, we average 100. And then Wednesdays, we average 50. Why are we losing 50% of our congregation every time we meet? I don't know. I'm here. Many of you are here. Praise God for that. But, but what, where, where do we fall in this category of uh, are we allowing God to do things in our lives? If so, are we accepting the responsibility of just doing the basics? Plus, God wants us to start. God wants us to realize our roles and then we have to anticipate what's going to be coming. I'm anticipating some things for Easter. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited about Easter this year. Yeah, we, we should be excited about Easter. Hey, out there next to that Bible printing calendar, we were sponsoring and I brought it up. We'd only raised a little over $200 this morning. We have completely funded that mission trip for that missionary. Hey, that, that's not because I said a couple words. That's because God worked in the hearts of some people and they put in the work. They took the steps. Guess what? We're almost through April on our calendar out there. Or March, rather. We have two more days in March. Hey, get in while you can. You still have a chance. It's still March. 
right? And then what happens? April's coming and May and June, July. Hey, why don't we fill that up before summer? And then after summer, we fill up another one. Why, would, why do we do that thing? Well, because I anticipate somebody from a Bible that we were able to fund being printed in our church, they're gonna get saved. And then when they get saved, maybe their family gets saved. And when their family gets saved, then maybe the neighbors and the friends get saved. And then they get Bibles that we were able to be a part of printing. Wow, that's exciting. And why do we do that? Because I, I wanna reap the blessings when I get to heaven. Daniel Ward. Yep. Come on in. Hey, here's your crowns. You help see so many people saved. And we won't know the extent of those results until we're on that side. But man, wouldn't it be awesome? To just to see the line of people and that our Elm Grove, maybe we all gather together and we sing some golden daybreak. Some golden daybreak. It just came. Now we're saying together, singing this song. Okay. And we're up there. And as a church, we, we see this long line of people and they come by. I was never part of your church, but because of your church, I'm saved and I'm here. Now, I was never in your church, but because of your church, I was saved and now I'm, out, now I'm in heaven. Grab your shovel. We, we, we got we to gotta get working. Christ is coming back. Man, we, we can sit here and we can say that, yeah, Christ is coming. Does that mean that we need to sit back further in our seats or be more urgent about seeing people saved? Where are you at? How clean are your shoes? Do you own a shovel? I got two. <laughs> Maybe three. I know Larry Angel's got some. He said, I can borrow anything out there. <laughs> Grab your shovel. Grab your shovel. Hey, start inviting people this week. Get them here next week. Get them here the week after. Why? Because missions is important. And we're all missionaries in God's eyes. Get excited about it. Let's pray. Lord, just thank you so much for tonight. Just this story from your word. Lord, just how encouraging it was for me studying this out, just realizing my responsibility. Lord, sometimes we get in our way. We like to insert ourselves into a role, maybe. Lord, we need to just let you move. We need to let you work. Lord, I anticipate blessings. Anticipate results. I anticipate souls to be saved. Remember, that begins with this body of believers. We need a positive spirit. We need an excited spirit. Don't, don't let us lose our zeal for our Christian lives. Lord, I pray in this time of invitation that we'll have that people just come. Or even if it's there at their seat, they just, they just sit down, they, they bow their heads, they, they pray that this next month, this spring program, this is the kickoff to something amazing. Elm Grove Baptist Church, from, from this point on, we, we are soul conscience. We want to see people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because we put in the work and we want the rewards. Thank you so much for this church. I love this church. Lord, I pray you continue to bless us. Help us move forward. Lord, but help us not forget our purpose. And that purpose through you, through your son. Lord, bless this invitation now in Jesus' name. Amen.